Cruise um, servers and they will handle the rest for us. They will make sure that there, somewhere in their computers uh, there is uh, our app running. Um, Heroku in particular has, well, it's not, it's not that relevant, but Heroku in particular has the way in which you deploy your applications is to something called a container. So you can think of, it doesn't really matter much, but you can think of Heroku has a ton of computers somewhere, maybe even in multiple places across the world, same for AWS, same from any cloud provider uh, as they're known. Um, and there might be two apps running on the same computer because these are huge computers and they are able to run multiple apps at once. Um, so what Heroku gives you is gives you sort of a container that for you, you could treat that container um, just as a computer, literally. Um, we could connect to it, we could, uh, and we could make network requests to it. And in that computer, on that, and more accurately in that container, we're gonna push our app and we're gonna run our app from that container because that container is in Heroku, it's connected to the internet. Um, Heroku will give us a URL to access our application there. Um, any preliminary questions about what we're doing today? Okay. So, this was actually the first lecture I ever gave. Uh, I know that was for winter's class. Um, it has changed since then a little bit, um, but this was how I got started. And uh, it was thanks to the encouragement of my, uh, by then, instructors, Corey, who's still here, and Reed, um, that, you know, they said, you should try to do that. And, and I did, and I enjoyed it, and I hope you like it. And this is also very exciting because, again, you put your apps live so that uh, anywhere in the world, um, anyone, anywhere in the world can access them. Cool. Um, so we're going to be doing, we're going to be modifying our apps slightly uh, to make them work on Heroku's computer, so to say. Um, don't just copy and paste everything. Try to make sense and ask questions about the process of why we put certain lines that we'll try to explain to the best of my ability. Um, our apps might break. Um, do not despair. Um, just look at the logs. They're all, whenever you're pushing something to Heroku, Heroku will tell you a log about what's going on, where your app is breaking. We just need to be careful on reading those. Um, same for deploying to Netlify. Okay, so let's talk about Heroku deployment versus static deployment. So, um, Heroku, oops, this was working just now. Heroku gives you, Heroku basically gives you a container which we can treat just as a, a computer. And in this computer that Heroku gives you, you can run any app. Not only Node, you could do, if you, if you write um, an app in Python, in Ruby, or any other programming language, you can throw it in Heroku and it will run there. So, So we can do this, and this is where we're going to put our back end. We're going to put our back end there because, oh, also another important thing about Heroku is Heroku not only gives you a container which you can treat as a computer, but also um, it lets you add a database to your Heroku um, app, basically. Um, and we want to put our backend there because our app or backend will generally handle routes, will handle um, some calculations of some, some sort, um, as well as getting records from the database, right? And Heroku then is sort of lending us that computer as well as a database. And our application has to retrieve information from the database just the way, in the same way that it retrieves information from our local database uh, running on our computers. 
Now, Netlify, similar. But Netlify is only for Netlify is only for deploying a static website. So if you write a website in plain HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, uh, you can deploy it to uh, Netlify, right? Or just even if it's even if it's only one HTML, uh, any static website you can deploy it to uh, Netlify. Um, So you can put like you can um, you can deploy your portfolio website to Netlify um, or, or through GitHub pages as well. And it turns out that our React applications that we have been building um, they come with the Webpack server that basically let us have code reloading. That's one of the main major advantages. But our, our React applications are still just front-end applications uh, that can be static websites. Uh, we're going to do a process which is known as compilation or building your React app. And what that's going to do is going to take all your React code and it's going to transform it into a few files that at the end of the day will be HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, now all that code that we wrote in React, uh, once it's compiled, comes out as just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Can you get converted back? So uh, you can't convert it back. Yeah. Yeah. This is compilation is a one-way process. Um, now, if we think about this, um, Heroku gives us a computer, as it were. Now we can do anything we want with it, um, with some limitations, but most of the stuff. Um, and we could set up, you know, we could set up this container, this computer, the way, the same way that we set up ours, where it will serve as both the back end and the front end. But here we're separating the process, um, just because having the back end and front end running in one computer is a little bit more complicated. Um, that is actually the all setup that we used to do, um, where we sort of combine our backend with our frontend, uh, and then just put everything in your order. Um, and then they live as one app at the end. But now, we're going to separate it into two. We put the backend in Heroku, we put the frontend on Netlify. We decided to go this way, because uh, if you have completely separate apps, then the, and which which they truly are two separate apps, then they can evolve um, <coughs> separately. So that, you know, if, if some, the, the back end can be updated without affecting the front end, and vice versa, the front end can be updated without having to uh, update the back end. Does that include like our API? Yes, our back end will serve as our API. We're going to be net making just network requests to our back end, yes. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? Yes. What's the difference between like a cloud-based data storage, like a Google Drive, mm -hmm. and Heroku? Um. Yeah. So Heroku is much more than just uh, cloud storage. Heroku can let you, since you can run any Node application or Python application. Um, you can do you know anything you can do with a <coughs> node application, like you can do calculations, you could do um, there are people that set bots, for instance, on Heroku to notify them when prices of things go down in Amazon or in other shopping websites. This this lets you run a complete application uh, where Google Drive, you know, just, just uploading files um, doesn't let you do anything custom. Here you can upload your custom code and Heroku can run that code. Um, other questions? So, this deployment that we're doing is specific to Heroku and Netlify, but it's 
generally, like if you look at the point as a whole, there's there are some shared ideas about sending your uh, application somewhere else on somebody else's computer that is going to run it. Basically, um, there are some of you might have heard of Firebase. It's a Google service that also lets you deploy your application. Uh, Firebase, I think, lets you deploy your front end and it gives you. Um, I don't think you can run a Postgres database yet, but you can run like their own database. Netlify is one of the thousands of static website hosts. Uh, there is one that is search, Netlify, and we can also deploy our applications to just GitHub pages. Um, because again, at the end of the day, our React application is just going to be HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, cool, let me see if uh, there's anything that I. Cool. So let's sort of give a, a quick note about environment variables. So, so far our apps have been running just in our computers, right? And we have a bunch of hard-coded stuff that maybe we haven't realized. Like the port our application is running on, uh, also our database URL. Those are hard-coded uh, strings that we have. Let me see what else. Anything else that we have hard-coded? Anything that says like localhost, for instance, that's sort of hard coded there that is only going to work in our computer. Um, but we want we want our application to be able to work on Heroku's computers, uh, for instance. And for instance, uh, Heroku will give us a different port. We don't know the port that Heroku is going to run our app in, as well as once we create a database in Heroku, we don't know the URL that Heroku is going to give us. Um, but Heroku is going to make those that those data, the port and the database URL, available through to our application as an environment variable. And let's talk about what that is. So I think I showed you a little bit of this in the past. But whenever code is running in a computer, it doesn't matter what kind of code it is. Um, there is an environment. You could think of it as you know, this is another one of those words that is taken from the real world, uh, where uh, there are different environments. There is the desert, for instance. There is the rainforest. All those are different environments, and there are different things available under those environments if you are in one of them, right? Um, in sort of, and that still applies to um, environments in computers. It's just that instead of sand, uh, there is uh, maybe a database URL that has a pointer, or, or instead of um, instead of fruit in the rainforest, there are maybe some commands that are available for our code to run. So whenever we're running code, we're running that code in an environment. Um, and more generally here, when let's let's actually just look at the environment. So if I go, if you open a terminal. Um, you can type this command called print env. And then that is going to output a bunch of stuff like this. And this thing that was printed here, you see, oh, environment variables are sort of key value pairs. There is, this is like the key or the name of the variable, and this is the value. Um, so let's see, for instance, lang here. This L-A-N-G, N-U-S, U-T-F-8, this is saying, uh, in this environment, my computer has the language set to English U.S., for instance. Um, this, this tells me um, where I'm currently at, right? This tells me what shell you're running. You'll probably see bin bash. I have a different one. Uh, this tells you, you know, who's the user that's logged in. Um, let's see which one else is sort of interesting. Mm, yeah, I think I think those are the most ones. Oh, one one very commonly seen is the path variable. Let's see this one. This path 
So all of these are environment variables. Any code that is running on my computer has access to the what is in the environment, to these variables. Um, from here, the path variable is one very common, commonly seen because whenever I type in a command, let's say like cat here, um, and let's say I want to do res.json. So right, let's go back to print env. But whenever I type in catch, this command or git, any, any command, is being looked at in the path of variable. So you can see that these are just a bunch of um, sort of paths, right? That's what the name of the variable. Uh, they're separated by column which doesn't really matter much, but these are locations where whenever you execute stuff, your computer is looking up if there are commands there for you to run. And whenever you get a command not found, let's say like tell, whenever you get something like this, is because your computer was checking everything that was in the path and it couldn't find it. But so, but in general, like path is a, um, an environment variable and there are others. So what we're going to do, let's export our own custom variable and let's see how we can access it from Node. So I'm going to go here. And in our terminals, we can do this. We can do export. And I call it my var equal, I don't know, my name. Know that we don't need quotes or anything here. This is this is not JavaScript. So if I do that, then if I do print env, I should be able to see my variable here now. Right? So this is I added an environment variable. Now let's say I want to access the most important part, let's say I want to access this variable from my JavaScript code, from my node code. Um, right now I'm just going to do node. Now I'm in node, now I get to, you know, JavaScript stuff. Console.log. Right? Um, but let's say from this code, and I said, whenever you're running code in your computer, um, you have access to the environment, to the environment variables. The way in which you can access that variable that I define that is in my computer uh, is if we do, let's do console.log, process. This is an object that is always available. It's just like console.log, always available. Um, and then there is env for environment. And the name of our variable, in this case I call it my underscore var. As we execute that, we get the content of that variable. Right? If I do just env, what do you think I'm going to get? All the environment variables. Right? Uh, this is because Node, when it's running, it loads everything that it sees in the environment and puts it in this object called process.env. So in this, uh, in this fashion um, is that we're going to have, instead of hard coding our database URL uh, or our port, we're going to uh, define those in our environment um, and just read them from there. We're going to have our code read the database URL from the environment as well as the port. In fact, if you look at, if you look at some of the, if you look at some Backend code, we can get to that later. Um, in the and this backend code was written with um, the Express generator. You go to the bin slash www file, you will see that where is where is where we set in the port, there is a line like this. Um, process that env env that port. This is because. Um, we can set up the port in the environment as well. Uh, let's see, so let's go back here. Cool. Um, 
two more things. One is uh, the environment, environment variables are a good place to keep secret stuff, like your API keys, for instance, when you're making uh, API calls or any other secrets that you want to keep, uh, you could keep them in, the, in your environment variable. Um, any other code that's running on your computer could access um, the environment variables. Um, generally, in our computers, unless we have a virus, that will be safe. Um, and once, once that code is running on Heroku, those containers are um, isolated. So they can't, there's no way that anyone could get to your environment variables, like your API key, uh, and so on. Um, right, so right now, uh, we have that, we have that variable that we defined. That my var, um, but that variable is temporary. It's not going to stay there uh, once I quit. So let's do exit, and I'm going to quit my terminal, and I'm going to open terminal again. Uh, let's do print env. See that my var is no longer there. We try if we try to do access it with node, it's undefined. Right, the variable is gone. Um, that is because we, the way in which we define the variable, with export like this, that is temporary. The variable will not stay there. Um, to make our Um, to make our variable stay longer, uh, we're going to use this package called .env. Once we get there, uh, we're going to see. But what this package is going to do is, well, we're going to put our we're going to put our variables in a file like this, and we're going to call that file .env, and we put our environment variables like this. Um, remember, oh, environment variables by convention is are all capital. Um, that's by convention. Um, I think it will still work if you do lowercase, but just go with uppercase. Oops. Um, oh, this this doesn't need quotes here. Uh, I, I forgot. Oh, this doesn't need. This would this would not need quotes um, on the value of the environment variable. And then what we're going to do is. We put that in a file, uh, and .env is a, a package that we're going to install, and it's going to load those variables for us. So um, you could think of it as running that export every time, but it's just going to be done by um, the node, uh, the .env. Um, so once once we get there, um, but any questions so far? Yes. Going to be accounted for by the secrets file, or is that a different file? Yeah, so uh, the .env file is this one. Once we get there, we're going to also emphasize it. But this file is, should be in your git ignore. It should not be pushed to GitHub, GitHub or anything like that. It should not be uh, being kept tracked by git as well. If you if you go to your, to your front end and you inspect their git, uh, their git ignore, you're going to see that env is already there. Uh, traditionally, any secrets or anything um, that is in the environment is in the environment. It's not to be pushed to um, Heroku or, yes, even Heroku or GitHub. Um, it's part of the environment. It's not part of our source code, right? Okay, so let's get to it. Um, so first, let's actually, the, the backend that we're going to deploy is this one that's here. So uh, get yourself a copy of this, clone it. Um, I'm going to do that maybe in CD core. And unit five. 
And here I'm just going to create a folder called deployment. And then inside of that folder, I'm just going to have, and here we're going to have a backend and a front end, right? Yes. What is, oh, um, right now, I'm, this is, right now it's in core unit five, but this is, this was the folder that we created, like, when we just started, where um, we're writing our code in class, basically. But you can do this in any, in any folder, as long as you remember where you put it. Um, Oh, this URL. It's on. It's on this. The first one here. In the in the README, I could also share it on Slack. That is the API that we're going to be using. Uh, so imagine you know, imagine we built this backend. Uh, it's a very simple backend. Uh, as I said, it lets you register users um, and get some bookmarks. Um, Cool, so here in my deployment folder, I'm just gonna do git clone, uh, and I'm just gonna clone it. I wanna clone it with a different name though. Uh, the name of the repo is Pursuit Core Web Hook E. I'm just gonna call it backend. When you specify git clone and then the URL, space a name, then git clones it to that um, folder. So now I'm back and I have my API. That change name you No. Um, if you were fork it? Um, no. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> cool, everyone has the back end? So let's open the backend with code. And if we look at this, uh, maybe some names are different, but uh, if we look carefully, we'll be able to understand what's going on. Um, so for instance, this, um, this backend is slightly different to the ones we have been building because it, this backend was not generated with the express generator, so it doesn't have like w, w, um, bin, www. Uh, instead, it has index.js. It doesn't have app.js, but it has index.js. This is sort of the first, when we first learned express, where we were creating uh, our own for the first time. This is sort of the way that we did it. Um, and um, yeah, so here, we're exporting the use the usual soft specs uh, here. Um, the creator of, of this API, which is another one of uh, our instructors, um, called like what we would generally call routers. Um, they call he called them controllers. This is a this controller are the same thing that we call routers ourselves, where we put we define the sub routes. Um, this is this comes from the controller comes from sort of other uh, languages that are uh, that just not name it controller, but that's our same thing. You know the controllers here could be our routes. Um, and let's see, it initialize an express, initialize uh, a port variable. Oh, now here what we were saying. Um, this will pick up the port from the environment variable if there is one. If there is nothing, then it's gonna pick 8080 as our port. Um, if this is truthy, then uh, if we have a port in the environment, that's gonna be pick that. Otherwise, uh, 8080 will be our port. Uh, again, this is sort of how he decided to create that. It sets up some middleware, um, sets up cores, sets up it sets up a route here, um, and then we have sort of our sub routes. We have slash API slash bookmarks to get bookmarks. And that is with the bookmarks controller um, and slash API slash users, users controller. Uh, so let's run this um, and see what we got here. So I'm in the backend. 
Um, we need to install the dependencies first, so let's do npm install. Cool. Um, now we have been running, we could do npm start. I don't think, um, and then we get the, our console log. npm start, remember that is going to execute the package JSON start script here. We see, for instance, that uh, he doesn't have the one that we have been adding, which is start dev for starting with notemon. Um, we could add it here, or just for now, since that's not the point. Um, I don't think we're going to change this, so I'm not even going to install nodemon. Um, let's just make sure that this works. Oh, even before we do this, before we have a, if we want to try this backend, we need to seed the database, right? Um, so if we go here to the folders, there is a DB folder, uh, and there's our DBJS, queries.js, seed.js, and SQL, seed SQL. Okay, I think I haven't seen this seed.js, but let's look at it. <coughs> All right, actually, let's do the SQL first. So this one we're familiar with. Um, so let's run this. Um, PSQL dash F seed oh bb seed sql oh i already have that database uh, because i had seeded it earlier um so do you remember that here at the top we will keep we keep a line like drop database if exists, I think. Bookie. I'm uh, just going to drop the database. You probably didn't get this error because you didn't have that database yet. So, um, okay, it dropped the database and then it created the database and it created two tables. One thing about these two lines, uh, we're actually going to end up um, getting rid of them, um, especially once we push our code to Heroku, because Heroku is going to give us a database already created. We're not going to have to create one. Um, and our app will connect automatically to that. So when we send this to Heroku, we're going to need to send this code to Heroku and execute it in Heroku to create our tables in the Heroku database. Um, we're going to need to comment these lines out or remove them. Uh, but anyways, we have our database. If we do reinspect it, um, what's the name? We book e. Um, I'm connected to that database. Let's see the tables. Oops, uh, not L. DT, I think it's. DT, we got our two tables. Right now, our tables are empty, so I do select star from users. There's nothing there, and there's nothing in bookmarks as well. This is because, well, we don't have any inserts in here. This is sort of the file to um, define our database. Um, the developer didn't want to do any inserts here, uh, and this is this is common. You may want to start with an empty database, or you may want to have something um, that where you start with some users uh, or some data there. Uh, I think what he did was this other file, seed.js. This is um, this is interesting. This is something that we don't do as often. Uh, well, we have actually never done it. But uh, what this is doing is we can see here that it's importing DB, our regular DB. Um, Query file, I think this is not even used. So I think we can move this. This um, is define is bringing in the database, uh, define an object with some tables, uh, some users, some emails, some bookmarks, and here is just inserting it with DB that none. So it's iterating, it's looping over the map, it's looping up over the users, and for each one, is inserting. Um, inserting uh, something in the database. Once that is done, it inserts 
uh, some bookmarks. And then it executes all of that. We promise that all and so on. This is not as important. I think this is also good to, you know, to give you more of a sense of a different approach in which you could see your database. Um, but it's not, it's not as important. But in this case, if we want to put something in the database, we could do it manually or we could just run this file, the seed.js file that the developer put here. So I'm going to quit from here, from my database. Um, let's see. Um, in my folder, I'm just going to go cd to the database folder. And from here, uh, I'm just going to execute node seed.js. Again, what this file is doing, the, the whole thing that it's doing is just inserting some preliminary data there. Uh, cool. It's inserted three rows. Um, let's connect to our database again. Oh, I uh, didn't mean to run that again, but oh, that probably duplicated my records. Let's do select star from users. Yeah, that duplicated. Since I ran it again, that duplicated my user. So I'm just going to quit. And see it with PSQL again to start a new. Since we now are in the database folder, I don't need db slash. That's the C. That's equal first. And then node c.js to insert some stuff in there. Let's connect. Select start from users. And we get our users there. Any questions so far? This is all this setup we're doing locally in our computers. Um, we're going to need to do uh, the same once we have uh, Heroku. Maybe we want our Heroku database to start empty. Um, OK, so any questions, comments, what we have done so far? Just started. We brought our database. We seeded it. Uh, the next thing will be run the server, explore a little bit around what we can do with it uh, before we can do the plot. Yes? We're, we're probably going to get there, but in removing creates and drop the database on top, how do you, well, I guess you wouldn't necessarily want to clear your database if you got one stuff, but how would you make an update to your database? Um, your that's a good question. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to get there. Other, yes, yeah. That's correct, yes. Um, it's just that the CJS, instead of doing sort of the inserts in SQL language, is doing it with JavaScript. But it's doing the same job, yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Since that's just for testing purposes, is there like a reverse seed JS file that you can make where it would wipe those temporary files out? Oh, that's a good that's a good idea. Yes, we could have a yeah an deseed or unseed file that just cleans up the database. Uh, and rather than dropping the entire database, we just you know maybe um, remove all the data. Uh, so yes, that's that's a good idea. We could have that file as well. Um, okay. So let's actually then run the run this app. Let me quit here from PSQL. Um, and then let's do, let me go back to my backend. Um, I'm going to do npm start. This is going to run our backend. Um, this is running on 8080. So let's go maybe on Postman. Um, and I already have something here. Um, Postman, I'm just going to do localhost 8080. Let's see, can I close this? No. When I hit send, then we get this response message. Welcome to the bookie API. The endpoints available are API slash users, API slash bookmark. So let's try this one. Let's try API slash users. Oops. Oh, uh, 
API slash users, not just users, API slash users. Uh, here we get a list of all the users. I think we could create a new user if we look at the um, if we look at the code of the backend. Let's actually just look at the what he called the controller. So let's go to users.js and let's see what we got here. So if we make a request to slash API slash users, we get all the users. We can get a user by ID as well. We can create a new user. Um, we can update a user with a put request and we can delete a user as well. So let's try a few from here. Let's create a, a new user. This will be a request to slash a post request to slash API slash users, um, and it's just going to use the rec.body for that. This we could, let's, let's actually look at that. Let's look at the our DB queries JS. Let's put it here to the side. Um, and let's put our controller here to the right side. So in here we have this route that creates an, a new user is a post and it's just calling db.createUser. So if we go to, um, oh, oh, I see. So the developer just called db our queries file. So our queries file is what he called here db. Right? That's just important. When we import that, it's importing this object with all these functions. Get one bookmark, get all bookmarks, get all users, one user, etc. Um, so when he does here db that create user, uh, the function that is being called is the one here db create user, create user this one. And we get our db dot non insert into, um, etc. So I think this was not necessary here on the spread operator. Um, Cool, so it seems, seems that to insert a user, we need an email and a username. So let's try that in our backend. So let's try it here. We're gonna do a post request to this endpoint. Uh, let's do a body, X form URL encoded, uh, email. Oops. <laughs> Uh, username. This is just to test the API, making sure that it works. Um, username. Cool. Let's hit send. Now oh, I said okay. <laughs> uh, I would have preferred replying with JSON, but that's okay. Um, now let's make a GET request to see if the user was inserted. Oh, how is spelling? Oh, okay. So then, poor error handling here. It should have not said okay, 200 okay. Let's try it now. There we go. So we are inserted as a new user. I think. Are any questions up until this point? This is a backend. This is also a good exercise for you to look at that backend and see how it's different from yours. But it's all JavaScript, and you understand JavaScript. That gives you another perspective. Um, let's try bookmarks, API bookmarks. Let's see what that is. I think this is an API that lets you, oh, lets you just save bookmarks. Um, and this, I guess, are website your website bookmarks, I guess. Um, so then, for instance, we have here that user with ID one, which is, I think it's Bill Gates, has a bookmark saved Microsoft.com, uh, and the title is Microsoft homepage. Um, and same for, I don't know who user two is. I think this is Jeff uh, Bezos. Anyway, uh, let's, I guess, just try to add a bookmark. Same drill. This, for this, we're gonna need to look at the I don't think this, yeah, this API doesn't have formal documentation. We actually need to look at the code to be able to tell 
what we need to insert a bookmark. Um, <coughs> let's look at here. Create bookmark. So create bookmark needs a user ID, a URL, and a title. Um, okay. And the endpoint for that is in the bookmark controllers. Um, this is how we get all of them. Oh, we can get a bookmark my title as well. Um, ID put, is there a post here? Oh, this one. Add a new bookmark associated with the user. Cool. And then we see that we need to pass in the user ID as a URL parameter. Um, and the user ID comes as a URL parameter that we access rec that around the user ID. The URL comes in the body and the title comes in the body. Cool. So with that knowledge, then if we go to our API bookmarks, let's try my ID, the user that I created was ID4. And the body we need, what do we need? URL. I'm going to plug in my personal website. Um, and the title. So to sort of bookmark it. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, this has to be a post request. So let's change that here. Uh, hit send. This OK is not tr trustworthy. So we need to check. Uh, again, let's change this to a get. Send. Oh. Uh, bookmark. Bookmarks. And let's see. Cool. Now we have our bookmark here. Let's say we want to delete this one. Uh, that's probably a delete request um, to the ID, maybe, like that. So that's OK. Let's try to get it. And that bookmark was deleted. So we get this back, and this is the back end that we're going to deploy. But, uh, this is the back end that I want you to use to follow along um, with the steps. Um, and any questions? Yes. Um, uh -huh, that's a good question. Um, here they're doing not here. Um, they're doing the old way, which is also good for you to see the, uh, that then. Uh, and uh, he's forgetting the that catch. That's why there. That's why there is no good error. Um, but this is the old way in which we, or the, I don't want to say old way, but it's the previous way in which we, when we didn't have async await, um, this is how we'll handle promises. Um, and this is, this will be, I like to format this like that. Catch error, where we do maybe console log the error here. This to be like that. Um, this is this returns a promise. Uh, if the promise resolves successfully, then this code executes. Uh, if the promise rejects, then this code runs the catch. So it's, it's literally the same thing. Um, it works in the same way. Um, at some point, I think it's personal preference on which one you go, rather than one being better than the other. They are the same thing. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, just async await came in, um, I think 2015 or 2016, um, and it makes our code a little bit more readable, uh, a little bit more top to bottom. Um, but these are this is also a fine way to handle promises. Other questions? Okay, so let's, I think we are ready to go. 
Oh, we had an error here. Email doesn't exist. Cool. That's, that was when we when I misspelled email. So I'm gonna kill that. Let's go back to the readme. About this, we talked about environment variables. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is make sure you go to Heroku, um, just heroku.com, uh, and sign up for an account. Let's do, I think I'm still logged in. Let me see. I, let me log out. Um, so when you go to Heroku, you get here. You just go to sign up, or if you have an account already, just log in your account. Um, here you have to specify your first name, your last name, email address, company name you can leave empty. Role you can put hobbyist or student or developer, whatever you want, this doesn't really matter much. Um, country, the US of course, primary language. Oh, here this is, you can see node. Um, and then finally, I'm not a robot. So make sure that everyone gets a Heroku account. So once you sign up and are logged in, you see a screen like this. Uh, yours is going to be empty or if you have developed anything in the past. Um, but it's something like this. This is your uh, Heroku dashboard. Make sure that everyone gets to the Heroku. I 
Yeah, I don't know what the is. Yeah. It's called a There are, there's a few ways in which we, so we're, right now what we're going to do is we're going to create a Heroku app so that Heroku gives us this computer that we can put code in. Uh, we could do it here, but we're not going to do it in here. Uh, by hand, we're going to use the terminal. Um, for, in the terminal, we need to install something called Heroku CLI, which stands for Command Line Interface. Um, you just Google that. I think this is an NPM package we can install. I don't remember exactly. Let's see. Oh, so if you're on Mac, you can do this. Brew tap Heroku. Um, if you're on Windows, you can do this. Uh, and if you're on Ubuntu, you can do this. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Sergio, since you're in Ubuntu, I'm not sure if you have Snap installed. Maybe you'll need to install. Okay. Cool. Um, oh, you could also, alternatively, you could also do this. I think this works for all of you. All of you. Um, cool. So, if you're a Mac, just do this. Yeah, anywhere. It doesn't matter what folder you do, you do it on. Um, this might take some time. Um, once you have it installed or to check, do this Heroku dash dash version. And if, it, if something shows up, then you have it correct. Um, once you install it, that's how you can verify if you, if you got it correct. Um, I think the installation might take some Try this one. Try this one. Oh, it's found lower in the. Yeah, you can leave that other thing in the.
Make sure that you do the work of that version to see what version you have on your Okay, I think I see some of most of you are ready to go. Um, you probably have a, a more recent version that I have. Oh, we could have also done this one. Yeah. Heroku is also an NPM package, um, but it doesn't doesn't matter which method you use. All of them are the same, um, or end up with the same behavior. Um, cool. So let's do, we verify that Heroku is there. Now the next thing you want to do is, um, because you're going to type in commands that are going to affect your Heroku account, you need to log in in the uh, CLI. And you do that, type in Heroku, login. That's gonna open a browser window where I think you can just have a button Oh, and mine is asking me to press any key to open the browser. So you just press any key, it opens the browser, you click this button, and then you're logged in into Heroku. So Heroku login, and you turn it on. You click the button, and then you can close the tab. And to check, to check if you're logged in, uh, I actually don't remember. Anyone remembers or knows? Heroku logs, but that's, oh, let's look at it here. Maybe Heroku config. Error. Oh, with when when you type in Heroku commands, you could do Heroku dash dash help, and it gives you all all the options. So, oh, maybe we could do Heroku status. 
Heroku status. Mm. What does that give you? Something like this? Okay, so I think I think you're logged in. Let's see. Run view apps. Oh I think we could try domain CI apps access manager access to apps. Let's try this one. Let's do Heroku apps. We do that and uh, mine is showing me all the apps that I have created. Yours should probably show maybe nothing, uh, but maybe something like this where it shows you your email address. What did it say? You found the email okay, cool. Uh, what we were looking for is just confirmation that that you have logged in correctly. Um, if we were getting an error saying you're not logged in, then we'll have then that means that you uh, are not logged in. So. Um, I think we're all set then. Now to create an, a Heroku app, what we do is this command, Heroku app of uh, Heroku create maybe. Uh, I should stop guessing and just look at the readme. Heroku create. Um, now you can specify a name for your app. Um, most names, most good names are already taken. So if I do my app, that is already taken. Um, and it says, um, oh wait, actually, no, it's not, it's not there is any already taken. Is that I'm using a, yeah. Uh, you can't put, I guess we learned something. We can't put underscores in your app names, only dashes. Um, they must start with a letter. Um, digits can only, lowercase letter, digits, and dashes, that's it. Um, so you can try to come up with a name. Um, maybe since this is a bookie, let's try a bookie. Let's try this one. Ah, that one's already taken. So we can do bookie backend, maybe. This one is so I got bookie back in. If you try bookie back in now, it's taken by me. You're not gonna be able to do it. In <laughs> uh, here, you could do, you could do, you could play that game of, you know, maybe it's something that identifies your app back in or app and something that is not as obscure. Or you could also just do Heroku create, and this gives you a random name, um, which is also fine. This gives me ancient peak fifty-seven fifty-seven zero. Um, Okay, so, oh, oh, uh, I think, um, cool. Now try to do Heroku apps again, and you should see your app there. Mine is Bookie Backend. The, let me know if you don't see your app. Okay, um, I should have said at the beginning that I think we're probably in the correct folder, but um, you would, you, it would have been good if you were in the folder of your backend when you did that. Uh, but there is no problem if you didn't because we can fix it. Um, but when you create a Heroku app, not only it creates it in Heroku, and if I go, if I go now to my dashboard here, I will see that new app. Um, the way that you are already seeing it as well. I have Ancient Peak and Bookie backend. I should probably remove this one. Let me remove it right now. 
Um, maybe I'll remove it later. Delete app. Delete that, um, and now we go to Bookie, and just like that, uh, we have created a Heroku app, um, and Heroku has a container for us ready to push code to. Um, now, so that created the Heroku app, and also it created um, a remote for our Git um, repo. So if we do Git remote, this is, I'm in the backend folder, git remote dash v. Um, now I see that I have origin, which is my address to my GitHub um, repo. And now I have Heroku with the address to my Heroku repo. Make sure that everyone has these four lines, one for Heroku, uh, or two for Heroku and two for origin. Yes. Uh, it's because I already saw that the first one succeeded. Um, it it did it doesn't it doesn't overwrite this one. Uh, you'll need to change it manually. Um, yeah, we can we can look into that later. Mm -hmm. So this is a git URL. So what this is is that we can push code to it, um, just like. You know, when we have our computers, um, there, is, there is Git here. Actually, there's probably, there's probably an image online that I could use. Remote Git. Uh, mm, oh, maybe this one. Yeah, this one is this one is sort of one. This one I can't see. Let's do Heroku. Cool. Oh uh, yeah, this one is a good one. This is the one. Um, so so far we have been working with GitHub, where we push our code to in case our computer catches fire. Um, and this is our local. Our local has uh, all our files in, and at the end of the day, um, you push code to GitHub, um, and then that gets saved onto another computer somewhere um, around the world where GitHub has their computers. Now, what we just did is Heroku is giving us another computer we can push code to. That is known as a remote. These things that where you push code to, those are those things are called a remote. Now. GitHub gives us a remote that by default is called origin. Um, Heroku gives us a remote by default called Heroku. And then we can push code now to these two places. Generally, the way that we'll be doing is we push to GitHub first, and then we push immediately to Heroku. It doesn't really matter, uh, but so that we try to keep this in sync. Um, push to GitHub first, and then to Heroku. Cool, everyone sees this uh, uh, Heroku line here? No? Uh, what do you see? Um, did you do the Heroku create and then the Oh, you did that, right? Oh, we did remove the did remove the
Um, Okay, so if you're, let's actually fix this. If you're not seeing your Heroku uh, remote here, what that means is that we didn't execute the create, uh, the Heroku create in the right folder, but we can fix that if we go to, um, let's see, if we do Heroku apps, does this give us a URL or no? No, it doesn't give us a URL. But what we could go, we could do is go to the, dashboard and then click on your app um, and then somewhere in here I think is since I have it on a smaller screen but you should do settings and then in settings if you scroll down you get this Heroku git URL so what you can do is then copy that copy that URL and it this is, you don't have to do this if you already have a Roku, but this is in case you don't have the remote. Uh, and then you can do git remote add a Roku um, and then paste the URL like that. This has to be executed in the backend uh, folder. Um, I'm gonna change the name of mine because I already have it just so that so that you see it I'm gonna call this maybe Heroku 2 even though it's gonna be the same um, I'm gonna git, git remote add Heroku 2 and now with I do git remote dash V again now I have six lines one Heroku Heroku 2 origin um, I just did that sort of to demonstrate that it was actually added did that work so did that work for you In, so if you go to the dashboard on your Heroku account, click on your app. Click on your app. Now once you're in your app, you go to settings. And then once in settings, um, if you scroll down a little bit, you get the git um, URL here. Now you copy that. And in your terminal, you do git remote add Heroku, uh, and then you paste the URL. This is in case um, um, in case your remote ever gets lost or doesn't work, or maybe you want to change it at some point. So it won't be that. Say that again. The more pages, what do you mean by pages? Well, if, so mm, not necessarily. You have remote, the number of remotes is just the number of places your code, you're pushing your code to. Um, I could have, there's people that keep like a backup on the backup where people push to GitHub and then maybe they also have an account on on Bitbucket or uh, GitLab, or there are some people that set their own, um, and then they push to GitHub first, and then they push to theirs, and maybe later they push to uh, Heroku. Um, so you can have as many remotes as you want, but those are places your code is going to. Generally, two is what we deal the most with. Okay, so uh, git remote dash v should let us see that. I'm actually going to remove the Heroku 2 because I'm not going to use it. To remove a remote, you do git remote remove Heroku 2 git remote dash v and we are back to our original ones. So these are the two things that um, create Heroku create does. It creates an app in the Heroku dashboard um, and it adds that remote so that we can push code to that. Now, um, we could push this code now, even though it would, it would break because of the hard-coded uh, URL we have. 
Well, let's try it. Let's try it and, and see what happens. So let's do a git status. I don't know why I have some change files. Oh, I guess I didn't change anything, did I? Say that again. I never added it. Yeah, yeah, I know I need to push it to Garoku, but um, I'm saying that if when I do git status, it seems that I change files. I change the files. Oh, I did change it. Uh, remember that I sort of formatted this, um, and I also got comment these lines out with those, and I dropped the database if exists. Um, cool, so I'm just gonna commit these changes. Git add everything, git status. Since if, if you, if you fork, um, you have your own fork. Um, if you didn't fork, it's not gonna let you push. It's gonna let you push to Heroku, but it's not gonna let you push to GitHub because GitHub is still pointing to the join pursuit account and you don't have access to push to that one. So that, that actually doesn't matter as long as you have push access to your Heroku one, which uh, we all do. So let's do git commit this. Uh, I'm gonna call this, I don't know, formatting and and add drop database to SQL file. So I commit those changes, and then um, since I do have access, I'm gonna push. Uh, and then now I push to GitHub. But that's not, we are used to that. Um, don't worry if you don't, if you can't push because you still have the remote pointing to join pursuit. Um, but here then we can push to Heroku, which is the exciting part. So let's do git push Heroku master. Now we're here that instead of origin, we say Heroku because that's the remote we wanna push to. Uh, we do git push Heroku master. Uh, this is probably going to break, but let's see it breaking. Um, we see much more output. Um, Bill succeeded. Oh, maybe it's gonna work. <laughs> we'll see. So nothing broke, uh, surprisingly. Um, and let's see what it says here. It says when so this is pushing to Heroku, and then Heroku is sort of replying back. Oh, I detected a node app. Uh, I created a runtime environment with these variables. Um, install binaries. Uh, Heroku will look at our package JSON and will install all the dependencies for us. We don't have to do npm install. Um, oh, we can see that here. Install dependencies. Um, then build, catch and build, running the, the dependencies. Oh, you can see this, for instance. Um, this is removing the dev dependencies like NodeMod, for instance, because those are not required to run the app. Those are just developer dependencies. It says build succeeded, compressing. So this seems to have gone well. Did it go well for everyone else? Okay. <laughs> um, let's see, then what I'm gonna do here is to open the app, you could click, you could copy this URL that you got. You could also do Heroku open, I think. Yeah, and cool, that works. We have developed, we have deployed our first backend. Uh, congratulations. Um, really easy, now we have, now I can send you this URL, you can send me yours and I can check out your app. Um, uh, but, you know, that'll be too, um, too easy to be true, right? <laughs> uh, right now, this works. Uh, we get to our API, but everything else is broken. If I go slash users, I uh, cannot get that, uh, right? If I go, oops, if I go slash bookmarks, we can't get that. Um, 
Oh, yes, that's correct. It's slash API slash users. Thank you. Uh, we get a blank screen, so not, not much better. Um, API slash uh, bookmarks. Get a blank screen, not, no signs of what's going wrong. Um, but there's definitely something going wrong. So why do you think this might be failing? Yes. Right, like where is this data gonna come from? Heroku doesn't have access to our database in running on our computers. We have to create a database um, for our app on Heroku and then seed that with some data there. So that's the step that we're missing. Uh, from here, useful, um, let's see, I think, hmm. there is this command, Heroku logs, um, that will show you your app. Uh, it shows you the logs of your app, so if you got any errors, you will see them here, um, and so on. So Heroku logs is how you can sort of access uh, the logs um, of your application. Um, I guess like here, let's see if we get anything, any hints here. Cool, so whenever, and this is something that I, I think I, I've been wanting to say um, for a long time, whenever something breaks, you are, you have to get literally in detective mode to see what broke and you have to, you know, read carefully um, with attention. Right now here, we get this error and it says, Error connect con refuse something was refused for some reason. There's some you know IP um, TC connect wrap that doesn't make much sense. Um, connect refuse connect 127 uh, port 5432. Where do we remember that port from? Postgres, right? So by picking up this port, which is a tiny piece of information in this, uh, then we're able to say, oh. Well, this is tr maybe our application, which is the case, is trying to connect to our Postgres database. Um, but one, we don't have a database on Heroku yet, uh, and if we, even if we did, it will probably not be running on this same port. Um, cool, so let's get into that. So here it goes back to the um, talking about the environment um, variables. So let's let's check back here. How we are. Mm, created that. This one. Set up our Postgres database uh, for our Heroku app. So to add a database to our app, what we need to do here is then Heroku add-ons colon create Heroku. PostgreSQL colon hobby hobby dev um, dash a and that this dash a is for the app name so in here we actually have to plug in our app name mine is bookie backend So it looks like this. Say that again? Hobby dev? Oh, this part? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so it turns out that Heroku is going to give us this container, this computer, and a database for free. Um, with some limitations, of course. Like our app is going to go to sleep if it's not being used. Um, so whenever somebody visits our app, it's going to take a little bit longer to load because Heroku puts that container to sleep to save energy um, and you know give you the service for free. Um, also, there are different tiers for databases. So if you want a production database, you um, you will probably have to pay for it. Um, now this Hobby Dev is you know it's a database for hobbyists uh, or people that are just getting started uh, with Heroku. Um, this Hobby Dev is a database that will let you have, I think it's 10,000 rows, 
um, if you start to grow more than 10,000 rows in your database, then um, Heroku will uh, ask you to upgrade to a tier where you have to pay to have more data saved. Um, so that's what HobbyDev means. Uh, there are others where once you have you know, set up a payment system or with your credit card, they will let you deploy uh, a bigger database. So HobbyDev is um, a database tier, basically. Documentation for this you can find in, I think, Heroku add-ons. Um, one of the most common is the Heroku add-ons Postgres, where you can find more information about it. Um, yeah, oh, we can even see here. This is where Heroku has their um, their Postgres running. They have one in the United States in the East Coast, so that's good, we're close. Um, and another one in Europe. Oh, here, going back to that, um, sorry, your Hobie dev here for free. Hobie Basic, $9 a month. This also tells you, oh, you see here? With with a free plan, you get 10,000 rows, um, RAM zero bytes, I'm not sure what that will mean. Postgres extensions, data clips, connection limit, um, and so on. Two backups. When you go, when you start paying nine a month, you get 10 million rows. Um, and there are, you know, Shield 8, this is probably for, you get, wow, <laughs> 48 gigs of RAM, three terabytes of storage. They didn't, they for, yeah, they don't count in rows anymore because that's so many. Anyway, there are different tiers. For now, we're using the free one. Uh, it's pretty incredible that this is for free. That they let us, you know, have our application running in one of their computers. That a few years ago was impossible. Um, cool. So that's what that hobby dev means. Let's hit enter. And then this is creating the database um, in Heroku. Um, Let me know if that succeeded or failed. Uh, yeah, it just makes a name for it. Um, you say it says created Postgres metric 7594 um, as database URL. So this then, um, you can think of it connected this, just that command connected our app to um, our database and made the URL available as a um, environment variable here, database URL. Now, if, if we go, like, we could, we could inspect the database, we'll see that it's empty. Uh, we could also, if we go here to our dashboard, I think, let's see, overview, uh, you, you're now going to see this, which is the Heroku Postgres add-on um, and the name. I think if I click here, maybe it's going to let me see the data also. Oops, taking some time. Cool, yeah, this lets me see the database with uh, like the health available. It has zero rows, it's empty. Um, seven megabytes, zero tables. Um, not sure, I think we can't run SQL here, but uh, we're gonna do that next uh, from our terminal. Questions so far about creating a database in Heroku? No, you can't. Uh, database name, you can't, it doesn't really matter what the name of the database is called. Mm -hmm. also the, database name, the app? The app? Yeah, the, app the app, you can change the name. Um, for free, you can change it for something that's available. Um, if you want a you know more exclusive name, then you have to get a domain, a domain name for it. Um, okay, so we get our database. We see it in the dashboard. Uh, I think the next step is to actually uh, see it. Right. So let's see that database. So this is actually the same process um, that or a similar process to what we will run locally. 
Uh, to see the database, I said we need to remove the create database, um, the connector database, and the drop database. In fact, let's try to run it with that. The way in which we will see our database is um, do Heroku PG PSQL dash F and then just like here F PSQL F this is what we do every every time uh, we just that is now going with Heroku PG um, F and then the name of our if, of our app which is Gookie backend for me um, oh no sorry um, after the F is the seed the SQL file so mine is in DB seed seed.sql if you're already in that folder you don't need the b slash um, and then a for my app Buki ba uh, backend like this so let's try to run that and this should break uh, saying the following so one thing here is connecting to, and this is the right name, right? This is a, the name of our database. And then it says, notice database bookie does not exist. Skipping, okay. And then it says, error, permission denied to create database. Uh, and then it says, connect title, database bookie does not exist, drop database. Uh, the point here is we got some errors um, and we have permission denied to create our database. Again, this is because Heroku gives us a database, a pre-made database. We don't have to create a database. We just have to create a table on that database. Um, it's just that when we're running Postgres on our computer, we have, you know, we are a super user. We can create as many databases as we want. Um, and we have, but on Heroku, that is all managed for us. So let's now go in our database or our SQL file, and I'm going to comment these lines out with uh, just prepending the comment. I, I, I don't know why mine is not highlighting the syntax, but two dashes just comments those lines out. Um, and I'm just going to leave the create table users. Now I'm going to run that command again. Hopefully this time it won't work. Cool. Now we got no errors and create two tables. Um, questions so far? Yes. Uh, what? A no database? What that means is that then this one failed. You have to try this one again. This one didn't succeed for you, is my belief. Uh, remember that this has to be exactly the same in the front, but after the dash A, you need to have uh, your own app. Um, let me take a look. Uh, this one, the dash A, and then the name of your app. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the, we don't push. Right, the, we just what we're doing here is. We're executing this file, but we're sending, we're executing this file on Heroku's database rather than our own. Um, so yeah, we don't have to sort of push to the database or anything like that. Um, so that created our database. I think there is a problem yet still with this where 
if what happens if I try to run it again? Then we get, if I try to run it again, it says that table already exists, those bookmarks already exist. Now, once you have a database in, in Heroku, um, that means that you, for the most part, um, or I guess I should say, once you, once you start to have users, like real users on your app, um, you will not want to maybe just throw all the data away by resetting the database in the way that we do it like on our computers, right? Uh, you know, it will be really maddening if your user signs up for your app one day uh, and then it comes back the next time their account is not there and all their information is gone. Um, but so for, for those, once you start to get user, um, there is something that you may want to look into, I, I hope I could get to show you later on, called database migrations uh, that allow you to sort of evolve your, evolve your database without having to destroy and reseed the entire database. Um, okay, so here, if let's say, you know, say we don't have any users and we want to avoid this error, so we could just do this. Drop table users if, uh, if, no, I think it's, I, if exists, users and I'm just gonna do the same for the one below bookmarks so let's try that again ah <laughs> this is all Cannot drop table users because other objects depend on it. Um, can't use drop cascade to drop the dependent objects too. Um, so we could do that. Maybe let's drop the bookmarks first. So that drops our table uh, and creates them again. And this is a very sort of, once you have users, this is not the way that you want to do it. Um, but for now, this is what we're doing. Okay, so we have our database. Um, I think if we do Heroku config, maybe. Yeah, if we do Heroku config, oops, wait, what? Uh, if we do Heroku config, uh, we're actually going to see the configuration variables or uh, the environment variables for our app. Bookie backend. And here it gives me this URL. It's a long URL. I think it's not even printing it at all. Um, in fact, I just exposed the password, but this doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, because I'm gonna destroy it after. But I think you could do Heroku. If that didn't work for you, you could do Heroku config dash A for your app and then the name of your app. This is the same thing. I just that sometimes it's able to pick it up. Bookie back and and then it gives you the database so this this is actually now a database um, in the uh, in the real world yes yeah to push changes to Heroku um, that are regarding your code uh, yeah you will do git push um, Heroku Master. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean like you, when you do, you did this, right? Oh, we're, we're gonna do that next uh, again, and, and then we can we can take a look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's we we saw that earlier. Uh, we're gonna see it again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is. This is the database that Heroku is giving you. It's giving you this is in this URL. In fact, you can see here that they actually don't have their own databases. They they rent something in Amazon AWS. Um, so this database is actually running on AWS, but Heroku does all that for us, creating the database there and giving us the simple URL that we could use to connect to it. Um, 
Okay, this URL is the one that we're going to use once our application is running in Heroku. When our application is, local, is running locally, we want it to still use the local host, um, the, the database that's running on our computers, right? Um, but just have in mind that we now have a database in here. We're gonna use, we're never gonna use this like um, URL directly. Like we're never gonna copy and paste it somewhere. We're gonna access it through the database URL environment variable. Um, and then just a, another quick note, if you wanna inspect your database, just like you do it with PSQL, uh, you can do Heroku, PG, PSQL, just like that. And then A for your app, um, bookie, back, end. And this is gonna connect you to that database. Now this is, you know, the same as if we were running PSQL locally. Um, and then I could do, you know, T, T, D, T or T, D, I forgot. D, T, to see our tables and so on. In fact, here we can see that this is, you know, when, we're in, when we are on our local, this has, says your name. Now here, this is, you know, this is a name that Heroku gave us. Uh, and we are, we are them, this, uh, we own these tables and this uh, database. Um, so in here, then you can do, you know, to inspect your data, select star from users, and you're gonna get data and so on. Um, very rarely you have to go in and check um, check the production database, but that's something you can do, again, with Heroku, PG, PSQL, those A for your name, and so on. Cool. So we have our database, we have seeded the database. Um, well, we have the tables, they don't have any data. Um, but then before we try to add any data, let's get our app to get the database URL from the environment rather than hard coding local host. Um, so let's do that, that's step four. So, what we're going to do then is in our backend, I'm going to create a folder, a uh, file rather, called that env. Create that file. This file by default, or you know, just um, as a reminder, any file that start whose name start with a dot are hidden by default. So if I do ls, I don't see it. But if I do ls dash L A, L for list and A for all, this prints everything. And we can see even the hidden files. So, you know, if you're inspecting it from the finder, you're in the finder, you're not gonna be able to see that EMV um, unless you have enabled show hidden files. But um, just know that it's there, it was created. Now, what I'm going to do then is um, I'm going to go on my code. Um, and I'm going to open that file. The .env file should always be at the root level, like with your package JSON and all that. Um, and here, I'm going to add this backend, no, not backend, database URL equal, um, and then what I'm going to do is my, just go to the, whatever you set up PG promise, in this case is this one, db.js. I'm gonna copy this URL from here. Oh, I think, um, yeah, this is fine. I think the way that we had it in the past is like const connection string. Yes, uh, and then we put here, you know, our URL. But this is how we will regularly do it. CS just for connection string, um, or URL, um, 
And here, this is the hard-coded part. This is, we have hard-coded this uh, URL where our database is running, but this is only local. So what we're going to do is, instead of that, I'm going to move that from here to my environment file. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it here. Just like that, no need for quotes. Remember that. And then instead of doing that here, what we're going to do is just access it through the environment. So I'm going to say process that env that data base URL. Okay, so we have this. Uh, now, if we run our app, um, we're going to get a problem, which is we don't have this environment variable loaded in the environment yet. So let's see. Let's try to do npm start to run our app, see if it breaks. Yep. So it breaks with this error. Um, so in invalid connection details undefined. This is, um, there is no connection string. Uh, there is no URL. The URL is undefined, right? This is again because we don't, even though we put the variable in the .env file, that variable is not being loaded uh, into the environment yet. We have to, uh, we're gonna use .env for that. Um, so let's do, Let's close that EMV. Oh, um, just so that we also sort of emphasize that, let's actually do a port here as well so that we don't hard code it in our app. Um, so I think the port we've been running is in 3100. Um, and in our index.js, in this case, we could then remove this. Um, if we wanted to, I'm just going to leave it there. So then this is going to be picked up. The port is going to be picked up from the environment. Uh, and our app, instead of running on 8080, will run on 3100. Uh, but again, that's sort of the point of um, the environment variables. So let's say we define these two here. <coughs> In fact, once we are in GitHub, uh, again, GitHub, uh, not GitHub, Heroku will give us a port. We don't even know what that port is going to be. We don't have to care what that port is going to be. Um, okay, so once we have that, we need to actually load the EMV file to for the variables to appear in the environment. What we do that is we do that with dot .env. So I'm going to install. EMV here. We're going to do uh, npm install dot env and dot not the actual dot but spelled out. We run that and um, that is installed. If we look at our package JSON, it should be there. Package JSON. Dot env is there. Oh, we have cores as well. That's good. PG promise, etc. Now for that dot env package that we install, um, we need to import it in app or in the main file. In this case, index. And it could be at the very top, just earlier in your application, uh, you want to do require dot env dot config. Just like this. This is the line that is going to look at our env, our dot env file, and it's going to load those variables into uh, the environment. Since Note here that since we 
We only need to run this once. That's why we don't save it into a variable. Right? We just require it and execute the config function immediately. There is no need to set it, save it to a variable like express or course, for instance. Yes? Yeah. bb.js So our application so far was breaking because um, the connection string was undefined it was because this was trying to pick it up from the environment uh, but the environment, the variable is not yet there we have to load that with .env.com Other questions? Okay, let's try to run our app again locally, see if it works locally. Uh, maybe see also if the port is now 3100. So let's do npm start. Okay, it worked correctly. I'm not sure if this is hard coded here. This might be hard coded. It is? Let's change that. Let's change this so that is. Like that. So that is no longer hard coded. Uh, since I'm not running node one, I have to kill it and start it again. And we see that now we are running on that port. That this is an indicator that uh, the environment variables were loaded and we're reading them correctly. Also, we have no error about the database um, with a URL that is undefined. So let's try this locally here. Uh, we go to slash API slash users. Oh, right, we're no longer running on 8080, running on 3100. Oh, I guess that added, it was a post, let's get a get. Um, cool, and we have our data functioning, our database um, the way we want it. Is everything working here? Let's see, get. This one's not working. Ah, oh, thank you. Cool. So we see that then we have successfully set up um, uh, some environment variables. Note that here, these are pretty standard, or at least for Heroku, database URL is standard. Port is pretty standard as well. Um, port is standard, I think, across um, database. Um, I have only seen it in Heroku. That's why we have it matching here. This database URL, we have that same variable, environment, um, environment variable because we saw that the URL that Heroku is going to give us is, is going to be available in this same environment variable. Cool. So we have our app uh, running again. Let's do, let's quit from here. Um, the next thing that we not want to do is get status and these are stuff that is that we have modified so remember that you don't want to add or push you that env file to github or be tracked by git this this project doesn't have a git ignore so I'm gonna go ahead and create it touch that git ignore Say that again? It has one? Uh, let's see. L. Oh, ls dash la properly. Oh, so it has one. Let's see what that one has. Uh, only two things. We need to add that env to it. So let's open it in our code. Dot git ignore that and here we're going to add env none of these things i want to push ever to github or heroku um, so let's ignore it there let's go to the terminal again git status now it's no longer in our git status um, 
here we did quite a few things. So um, you can check whenever you don't remember what you did. Um, you can do git diff, and this shows you it's a little bit hard to parse, but this tells you what the changes that there were, and you can have a better idea of what went down. Um, I think I'm going to convert this uh, in a few commits. So what did we do in seed? In seed, we commented out the the create database and drop database. Um, and then drop the tables. Yeah, so I guess uh, let's commit that. <coughs> git add, I'm gonna only do that, only in one. So I git add that, git commit dash m, let's say um, remove or comment out create slash drop of database in SQL file. That's what we did there. Now, we did something in DB, which was to set up the, pro the environment variable. In index.js, we load the .env module. So all these changes then are related. We can commit them in one, right? Um, this package JSON changes where when we install the .env index, we require .env at the top and call the config function uh, and db. Uh, we stop hard coding our URL and read it from the environment. So since those are all uh, similar, so I'm just gonna git add everything um, and then git commit. The message for this commit will be something like um, read database URL from environment and install .env. This is what we did. Oops, too many M's here. Cool, we committed that. Now, uh, we should be ready to push again to um, Heroku. First of all, I'm gonna push to, I'm gonna push to uh, GitHub first. Push origin master. Then shortly after, I think, oh, and this was the stuff you were talking about. When we do git push Heroku, master, our code is going to be sent to Heroku, uh, and then we get some extra output seeing it detected a node app, um, it's installing the dependencies, build succeeded, compressing, uh, and then we got our deployed app uh, again here. So we could do Heroku open or just copy and paste the URL. And everything seems to be working. Uh, yes. Sure, you push, uh, Heroku. Heroku master. Here. This part. Yes, I pushed to GitHub here. When you push to origin, is that GitHub? Uh, no, I pushed two commits. Yeah, but it doesn't really matter if you push in one. Cool. Um, this go well for everyone? Cool. So let's see. Um, let's do Heroku logs. So if we go to Heroku logs, um, we're going to see we can see when it started, when it stopped working, or are all errors here. This Heroku logs gives you like a timestamp here. It's a little bit hard to parse, uh, but this is a timestamp. This is the 22, um, oh, the 4th of February of 2020. 
Uh, and here is still the third. Um, this is probably because this is UTC time. Uh, but anyway, that's if you subtract, I think, four from here, then you are on the local time. Or four, is it four? Yeah. <coughs> It's 1 a.m. It's 1 a.m. Uh, uh, Greenwich Meridian. Anyway, here we see um, stop all processes. I think this was when the bill the bill succeeded. Then it's a starting process with command npm start uh, book node node.js node index.js. We actually see the console as well. Oh, look at the port that the Heroku gave us. Hiroku gave us this port, 21921. Um, that is not really important because we're going to access it through the URL. And then it says start state change from starting to up. So our app is running correctly. Now when I when I loaded, when I send that first request, this is the this is sort of that log. There was a request to slash path. There's one way in which you can get the logs running, which I think is logs dash dash tail. And the logs are like running. Uh, if I make another request now, we might be able to see it. Let's do API slash users. So we should either get an error or this in the terminal. Uh, tail. Um, so we can see here that our app is no longer breaking. We should have, we would have seen the error. Uh, we get an empty array now. We don't get that blank screen that we were getting before. Uh, let's try bookmarks. And we got our array again. Um, no errors in our logs. So our app is working now, which is great. Questions so far? Sorry, I'm getting Oh, maybe you need to do that A and then the name of the app. Heroku logs. Once you start to have more apps, um, sometimes. Heroku is able to pick up what app you are interested in based on what folder you're on. Um, if not, you can do this Heroku logs. I think if I'm, yeah, if I'm, oops. If I'm a com folder and I try to do Heroku logs, I think you might get confused because it doesn't know what app I want to access. Yeah. But if I do it like this, even though I'm not in the, in the folder, it will pick up the logs from that app. To quit from the logs, you just do Control C, just as if you were killing Node and so on. Yes. Um. So I'm not sure. Um, here, when you send this network request. Um, you should get an, the MTRA. You get a blank screen. Uh, what about your Heroku logs? You should probably, if you're getting a blank screen, you're probably getting an error here as well. Question so far, is everyone seeing the MTRA? Let's try to send a post request to add a user. In Postman, instead of this localhost 3100, I'm going to use the URL that Heroku gave me, which is, I don't remember. Oh, here. This one, HTTPS, back here. So note that this one is now my 
this is my URL on Heroku. If we can send a post request with some body, um, oh, wait, let's actually add a user because I think, I fear that if I try to add a bookmark, it's gonna fail saying that user doesn't exist. So let's add a user first. Or actually, yeah, let's do this. I'm gonna get, you know, this is the same request that I'm crea creating with the browser, just that now I'm doing it with Node, a get request. Yes? Um, we can seed, yeah, we, we could run that seed.js file. Um, we'll just need to make sure that our PG promise is pointing to the Heroku URL. Um, yeah, we're not gonna do that now. Um, let's just make sure that everything works. So this was a get request, now let's send a push request uh, with this body, hit send, replies okay. Uh, now let's get back to a get request, send, and we have our user. Let's maybe try to send a few more. It shouldn't take a while. Send. Oh, that was a get. Um, post. Send that. It says okay. Let's change back to get. And we have two users. Now these users are in the Heroku database, not in ours. Uh, yes. It's been posted. Um, it's just the um, you have to make a get request to get all the users and see. Questions, comments. So now we have a full fledged backend running on Heroku uh, with the database included. Yes, Malik. Say that again. Uh, no, uh, we could come tomorrow and this user will still be there. Mm -hmm. Unless I run the SQL file, which will drop my tables. Um, but yeah, this, this information will be potentially stored forever uh, in this database. Um, do, we, do, you have, do you have a question? Um, no, we're just like, you don't need to watch it like a web thing, sorry. <coughs> That's a good um, that's a good observation. Yes, we to we don't need to start our Heroku app. Heroku will start it for us, um, and you will see that after some time, it's gonna put it to sleep to save energy, uh, and so that it doesn't have to charge you for having it running, um, and so on. Um, yes. If you use if you use this database, um, if you use this URL, then you will end up adding something to my database. Um, that then will will implement user authentication. Um, cool. Let's take a break. Uh, let's take maybe let's take ten minutes before we move on.
Where, like, it sticks to, like, the, the cup, and you know what I mean, where it spells? You know what I'm talking about? It doesn't have, like, that, like, fourth thing that's that spells.
Okay, to Heroku now. Um, it's it's incredible how quick it can be once once you deployed a few uh, times. Um, it's it's pretty incredible that you can just push code to somebody else's computer um, and it runs your app. Um, any final questions on backend deployment before we move on how to deploy a front end? Yes. Oh, um, if you want to like pre-populate some data, um, I, I don't want to do it, um, but it will be something like this. You remember that we had this file, seed.js file? Um, something I could do is, and this file requires the database, right? Uh, and if we go to the database here, we have this, which is going to load it from the database URL. I'll just need to make sure um, that in my here, just to seed it, I'll paste the database URL that I have from Heroku, uh, and then run it, um, and then put back my database, my all database. Um, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, too much work. Well, hmm. Yeah, it will be. It will be. In, just to do that, I'll need to remove this from here, and then paste my Heroku URL here. So I'll need to do Heroku um, config. Bulky backend. Oops, I misspell back end. And then from here, I'll need to copy this URL and paste it here. Save and then execute seed. I guess, I guess <laughs> we ended up doing it. Let's do it. Um, here, I, if I want to see that database, I need to point to that database. Um, and I'll do then node db seed.js. Um, details is not defined. Oh. So since we have, hmm. do you remember what that we saw this error before? <clears throat> Why was this error happening? This is because the um, database URL is not in the environment. It's, it's not been loaded in the environment. Um, and we saw that that is going to be loaded in the environment by index.js here at the top. This is what loads that database URL in the environment. So you know what? To, let's put this back like that. So if you want to see your database in Heroku, uh, the easiest way to do it is you do it here. Export database URL. And here you paste the URL from 
Heroku. But again, this is just only because we have this weird seed.js file. Um, but we can make everything work. So if I do this, that exported the database URL, then I could do node seed dbc.js. Um, and it seems that we're not going to be able to do it then. Hmm. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not going to be able to do it easily. Um, to see the data, uh, it will be just write it in SQL and then execute the SQL file. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, of course you can script everything. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think is. Um, I could I could share with you later on um, a line of code that you could use to see it. It's just because it's the way in which we're authenticating. So the database that Heroku gives us is a secure database. You have to, you need a username and a password to log in into that. In fact, if we look at the database URL, my username and password are in that database URL. This is me, this is my username. Uh, and after the column, this is my password. Uh, maybe I'm going to here. Um, and it's just the way in which we're authenticating to the database. Um, that is making it fail. But yeah, I could I could show you later on maybe the people that are interested in seeding it in this fashion for the future. Um, any other questions about backend? Oh, this we have only fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think we could do it um, in fifteen minutes. That's because the front end is much easier. Um, so I don't have a front end, but I'm going to close all this. Close all this. Um, I have, what I'm going to do is, um, I think we had the React started project that I had in here. Uh, but that's going to take some time to install. I think, oh, well, this is installed, we can create our Netlify account. Um, I think we have it here, React. I'm just gonna pick this. Um, remember that this is this is just a create React app that I laid down. So I'm gonna copy that and clone it here. Uh, I'm gonna do git clone. Oh, I should have named it. I'm gonna rename it to be frontend. Just one more. And I'm gonna cd into the front end uh, and do npm install. I'm just taking any any front end. This could be any front end you have. Um, now, one thing that is important to note here is that we are going to uh, in the future. And this is personal preference, but I'll I'll is my recommendation. In the future, you're going to have two GitHub repos, one for the backend and another one for the front end. They are two independent apps. Uh, let's keep them separate. This will allow you to, one, uh, have less merging conflicts because somebody changed something in the backend uh, and uh, you were working on, um, or maybe they changed something in the backend, their intention was to change something in the backend, but they ended up changing something in the front end as well, and you were working in the front end, merge conflict. Um, also, as I said earlier, this will allow your applications to evolve independently, where the front end can change independently uh, of the back end and vice versa. Um, so in the future, we're going to have one repo for front end and one for back end. Um, generally, you can call them something like, you know, let's say um, one of the apps, the holding app. Let's say the holding app that um, Douglas Team created will be, you could have 
to have their repos be holding dash backend and holding dash frontend or holding dash server and the other one holding that uh, or whatever name of the app of the app dash uh, client. Like remember that backend and server is the same thing, frontend and client the same thing. Um, cool. So that install that. Um, now let's go on Netlify. We'll see. We'll see if we can make it. Go on Netlify.com. Netlify just like this. And then sign up. The cool thing about the sign up in Netlify is that you can sign up with your GitHub account so that you don't have to remember yet another password. So you can just click on GitHub. I think, am I logging? Yeah, I'm logging with GitHub when I register. Um, and I have similar, you have, um, you have a dashboard. These are all the apps that I have ever deployed. I've never looked at, I haven't looked at these in a, some time. Um, well, yesterday I was trying to put something. But similar thing, you have a dashboard, and then here you, we're gonna put, uh, we're gonna push our apps to. Um, in the same way that Heroku, you can do it through the uh, inner, to, through the graphical user interface. Uh, the same thing here, you can create new site. Um, yeah, actually, let's do it this way, and then I'll share with you the uh, how to do it in the terminal later on, just because this is actually faster. So everyone gets a, an account in LFI. Just click new site from Git. Oh, I guess, yeah. I didn't even need to clone the repo. Um, and here you're gonna go to GitHub. Um, you need to authorize it, so this is because I'm already authorized. Um, but yours is gonna ask you to put your password in there. Yes. Should we sign up with GitHub or with GitHub? With GitHub, yeah. GitHub. And then you have to like allow it to see your Git, GitHub repos. Um, once you do that, you should be taken to a screen like this where you have your account. Uh, the app that I want to deploy is the React Starter. So I'm gonna go here because I have it in a separate account. Um, and then the cool thing about Netlify is that it picks up, if it's a React app, it picks up a bunch of stuff for you. So it fills out these two things. This npm run build is what we will use to compile the application. Uh, this step we'll need to do manually if we were developing, um, if we were deploying manually. Uh, and this is where that the, when we're building a React app, it's turning into just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript plane. Um, and that is going to go into this folder, the build folder. Uh, and I think you just click deploy site. Uh, this is, this takes some time. Again, here, um, Netlify gives you a random name. Um, you can change it. I think if you go to site settings, um, change site name and the same, same deal. Most of the good names are taken. Um, you're gonna have to try and guess. Um, my app. Oh, well, that one's because it has the numbers. Probably not taken, these numbers are not taken, but if I only have my app, I'm sure it's just taken, right? That one is not taken. So our app is um, Netlify is connecting to pulling my app from my GitHub um, and it should be deployed. Let's try it out. If we go to overview, oh, still in process. I think we can see the process if we click on here, site deploying process. It says building. Yeah, and then this is what it's doing. Similar logs. Finish. Site is live, so now I think it's live. If we click on preview, uh, then we see our app. Um, and this is this app just has this. If we, hmm, yeah, I think we're not gonna have to. 
And here we could just have this app make a request to our backend to get information from. Maybe we'll, we'll see that tomorrow since uh, we're running out of time. Um, and I think Dessa may have an announcement for us. Uh, but that's that's it for our, for today. Yeah, sorry, the final question. Yeah, just really quick, uh, so you clicked on React Starter to launch that. Yeah, I, when, when you're in here, you just click on new site from Git. Here you point into GitHub. This is, and then here you pick your account. Well, you, you're, you're only gonna have one. Uh, and then you can search for your for your project here. Let's see, what other app do I have? Uh, I think I have something called production client. Can I reuse a repo? Is this making new repo? Yeah, you can reuse a repo. What do you mean by reusing? Like, uh, can I only use React Starter once on that? No, yeah, you can deploy as many React stories as you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, here, this is an example of what I was talking about. I have an app that I call production, which is a to-do app, um, and I have a folder called production client, which is my front end, and production server, which is my back end. Right now, let's, let me try to deploy this one. Deploy site. Um, maybe we'll deploy, I think it will deploy, uh, it should deploy. Um, that is just a regular React app. Probably the data is not going to show up because uh, the URL that it, the data is pointing to. Um, any other final questions? So this is out of the manual part on um, on the interface. In the README, there is one where you install the Netlify CLI and you can do all the same steps with uh, um, from the terminal, basically. Final questions or thoughts? No? Hi. I Hello, Dancer.